I would like to continue talking about some aerosol chemistry records from Green and I scores, which show imprints of rapid climate changes in relation to the uh, Dansk Kaleshka events. And of course, uh, I would like to start acknowledging my co authors because measuring an I score of more than or three, up to three kilometers length in seasonal resolution is a very huge task. And so there is a series of PhD and postdoc uh, and the old Neem Aerosol Consortium involved in this. Um, well, you've seen that record already yesterday a couple of times. It's the record of the enigmatic Dansgaard Oeschke events, uh, ch temper changes in Greenland of 10 to 15 degrees in a couple of decades. And what I would like to point out is that they also have a global impact via shifts in the IDCZ, um, as for example shown by the poster by Rachel Rhodes yesterday, and having an impact on methane concentration. So we get also a global impact of Dansgaard Oeschke events, but we have rather little information about environmental and atmospheric changes directly from data which are connected to this. And uh, this gap can be actually filled by looking at aerosol records. And I showed you here three examples of aerosol species that we can measure, for example, here in the Neem I score. We can measure, for example, ammonium, which is a biogenic tracer coming from North America. We can measure sea salt aerosol, which comes partly from the open ocean, so from the North Atlantic but also, as recently shown, uh, <coughs> also by a paper by Rachel Rhodes, also from uh, sea ice here, especially in the Baffin Bay. And we can look at mineral dust aerosol, which is actually very far field information because it comes from East Asian desert regions. And all this information comes uh, into the ice core based on the same age scale and uh, in a joint ice core record. Um, so this is what we got to do. And you can measure this in very high resolution, actually seasonal resolution. The chemistry data is actually used also for dating the ice core, so you can count the annual layers. And this is just the record from the Neem ice core as measured. And you can see here are the biogenic tracers. Here is sea salt aerosol, mineral dust, and there's also sulfate. But here I will just talk about ammonium, sea salt, and mineral dust. And you can already see quite clearly that there is a strong imprint of the Dan Skaleshka events. For example, here, uh, in mineral dust aerosol, there's a factor of more of a factor of 10 change between stadial and interstadial conditions. So remember that number, but don't remember it too hard or to don't, don't memorize it in your brain because the chemistry that we measure in the ice is a convoluted signal of several things. We measure the concentration in the ice core, but what we're really interested in is the measurement is the concentration in the atmosphere at the source which is reflective of the emissions changes. And so emission changes ch uh, lead to changes in the atmospheric aerosol concentration. But then we have a long-range transport, and during this long-range transport, we have a lot of loss of this aerosol, by, especially by wet deposition. So this aerosol loss is dependent on accumulation rate, which also has changed in the past. And then we also have the transfer function over the ice sheet, so the transfer from atmospheric aerosol into snow, and that has also an effect. But the major effect here is really the loss during transport. And so if you want to have some information about what's going on here, then either you have to correct for this transport effect, or you have to look at parameters in the ice core record which are very little or not affected by this atmospheric loss. And so these are the two possibilities, and I will show you three examples what you can do with aerosol records which are partly correcting this or looking at robust information. Uh, let's start with the correction back in time. And I, for the sake of time, I don't explain you how it works. It's a very simple deposition model. Essentially, there's an exponential decline in concentration in the atmosphere, which is dependent on the wet deposition flux, which is uh, dependent on precipitation. So now these are, uh, the, is the ratio of the concentration um, relative to the pre-industrial value at the source. So this is corrected for this transport effect. And what you can see here is, for example, in the biogenic ammonium, there is essentially no Dansgaard Oeschke, there's no Dansgaard Oeschke variability. So the temperature warming in North America doesn't lead to an increase in ammonium emission. And essentially it's because the, the uh, ice sheets don't change over the time. If you look at mineral dust and sea salt aerosol, then you can see in this smooth version that there is still significant stadial interstadial variability, but it's highly suppressed relative to the ice core concentration. For example, ice core concentrations in calcium were a factor of 10 between stadial interstadials, 
And here in the corrected record, there's only maybe a factor of four to five left, which is really the emission change. The same holds true for sea salt aerosol measured in the ice. You would say, oh, there's six times more sea salt aerosol in the ice in the stadials and in the interstadials, but, cor but correcting for this effect, there's only a change of two to three left over at the source. Um, it's also very dependent on the assumptions that you make. For example, if you assume that all the sea ice comes from the open ocean, then you still see this stadial interstadial variability, but then the glacial level would be actually lower than the interglacial level. If you assume that all the stuff comes from sea ice, aer from sea ice formation of sea salt aerosol, then again you have a two to three times stadial interstadial variability, but the glacial times are actually higher. So it's also very uh, depending on your assumptions. Another example uh, how you can use the aerosol records is not doing this correction, but looking at information that is independent of the transport. And here I look at ammonium as a fire proxy because ammonium is, the background is derived from nitrogen uh, turnover in soils. But on top of that, you have individual peaks which are related to fire events in North America. And the number of fire events, of course, is not dependent on how much loss you have during transport. So what I do here is I only count the number in a certain time interval. And so what you should look at is this bottom plot here. And this is the number of fire events in a 200-year window. And again, you can see that there is a very clear stadial interstadial variability. While looking at the background concentration here, uh, for example here, which is the nitrogen turnover, you don't see stadial interstadial variability. So the fire, actually fire activity is increased during the warm interstadials, and that may be related that during the warm periods you have higher fire ignition risk because there's more lightning activity, but also there might be more fuel at that time. The last example that I would like to show you what you can use these uh, aerosol records for is looking at the phasing, and that is actually following up on the talk yesterday by Emily, uh, and she, where she concentrated on the stable water isotopes. And here I would like to look more at the chemistry records and look at the phasing of the chemistry records in these aerosol records. And uh, the, the method that we use is a little bit different from Emily's, but overall the, uh, the approach is the same, but in details is a little bit different. And so what I'm looking at is the phasing between sea salt aerosol which is derived from sea ice, mineral dust, uh, indicated by calcium, which is coming from the East A Asian uh, desert regions, and also the thickness of an annual layer in the ice, which comes from counting the annual layers in those high resolution chemistry records. And again, we fit a ramp, make some assumptions about the noise process here. We assume that it's red noise process and do an abrasion approach. And here you can see Similar to what Emily showed yes, yesterday, the phasing first of the onset of the warming, here in the middle, the midpoint of the warming, and here the end point of a warming between stadial and interstadial transition. And the first thing that you see is similar to Emily, the uncertainties are very large. But if you squint, you would say, especially here in the midpoint, that ma the majority or many, nearly all the points here Sorry, I have to say, this is calcium, for example, here in pink, relative to sodium. So this means calcium comes before the sea salt aerosol. Mineral dust comes before the sea salt aerosol. And the same, the green one here is the layer thickness. So again, layer thickness comes before sea salt aerosol. So everything is relative to sea salt aerosol. And if you squint, you would say that the majority, or nearly all of them are uh, actually, both layer thickness and the mineral dust from East Asian desert regions comes before the sea salt aerosol, which is derived from the sea ice reduction during this warming. And uh, Ray actually yesterday uh, came up with this question, how can we, can't we use this joint information of all the Danskat Oeschke events to get a more uh, representative and more signi significant answer? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, if we assume that all Danskat Oeschke events are in principle doing the same thing, then we can actually stack them together. Um, if, they, if they are not the same thing, if they are dependent on the glacial, st uh, the climate state, then maybe this would be, uh, give us uh, false um, implications or uh, interpretation. But since 
just from a statistical point of view, since they're all earlier, and they are all within their uncertainty the same, I just do the thing, and with the Bayesian approach, we can then come up with a joint probability function of the phasing of those aerosols relative to each other. And uh, this is my last slide. Um, so <coughs> what you can see here is green, again, the th layer thickness, giving us an estimate of precipitation. In purple, the mineral dust relative to uh, sea salt, and then that gray is delta 18 over, Emily has already talked about. And what you can clearly see is that both the, the starting point, the midpoint, and maybe also the end point, but there it's not so clear, the mineral dust and the layer thickness comes before the sea salt aerosol. And so interpreting this at the face value, you would say, okay, the whole dansgaard oeschke event starts with an increase of moisture transport uh, towards Greenland, which is a change in the atmospheric circulation from the subtropics to Greenland, pretty much in phase with the change in a mineral dust mobilization in the East Asian desert regions, which is connected at the same time to a shift in the IDCZ and shifts in the monsoon, and therefore also in aridity and uplift in East Asia. And only after 10 years, the sea salt aerosol is reduced, and that is probably because this North Atlantic region needs some time to warm up, and then the sea ice is slowly shrinking. And so there is a uh, sequence of event that is consistent with some first order uh, estimations. So my summary, first three points are not so important, that's uh, uh, published knowledge. But here is the import, uh, important part, so we don't see any stadial interstadial variations in the ammonium background, but we see significant change in fire activity. And we can derive a sequence of events if we assume that all of the dansgaard oeschger events are the same. And this is a very important uh, benchmark for models because we see this sequence of events in our data. And then the models, of course, should also support this in their sequence, sequence of events. And with this, uh, I hope to answer your questions. Thank you. There was a talk yesterday on methane isotopes and there was the message that we have more biomass burning towards recent times and I don't see it in your record. So is this some, something <coughs> different? I mean, first of all, the methane gives you an information about fire frequency, which is a global average. So everywhere where you have fire, because the lifetime of a methane is on the order of 10 years, much smaller than the mixing time. So it can be anywhere on the globe. And this here is only information which shows you the fire activity in North America, say it's north of 40 degrees north. And so that might be, but also there, if you would extend this towards the Holocene, there is a significant increase in both fire activity as well as in the size of the fire peak. So I would also say that there is more fire activity in the Holocene relative to the glacial. Between stadials and interstadials, are you changing the way you're kind of back calculating the source emissions? Say, are you tra changing the transport time or the deposition? And then when does that change kick in in time? Okay. <coughs> you're referring essentially to this uh, plot here. Um, in these two plots, I actually keep the constant time, uh, the, the transport time constant. This year is a transport time which is short on the order of two and a half days, which would be about the transport time for the Baffin Bay, and this year is a transport time of five point something days, which is for the open ocean based on back trajectories. Um, we also did some, I did some runs where I changed the transport time with climate, and they're lying in between. So this is giving you kind of the upper end and the lower end of what is possible. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to move from the uh, observational uh, domain to the modeling domain. Uh, but I'm going to start with a fairly familiar plot that we've seen some uh, aspects of several times in this session so far. So the top panel shows the um, uh, Greenland uh, Delta 18 error record, uh, uh, which you're very familiar with, showing the last 50,000 years or so of uh, Dansko-Lushka abrupt climate change variability. And on the bottom, just focusing on dust, which is really the, is the focus of, of this work. Um, and you can see, uh, as we just heard, there's a lot of co-variability in terms of the abrupt warming in Greenland and abrupt reductions in dust supply. Um, and so the work I'm doing is really to, um, from a modeling perspective, to understand 
the linkages between those two records, and what does what do these uh, the characteristics of the dust um, change uh, tell us about about these abrupt climate change events that we don't fully understand? Uh, and I, sh I should have uh, um, also point out there's other records of dust um, change uh, from around the globe. So this is a, a recent record from uh, the Atlantic. Uh, ocean off of the African coast showing abrupt variations in dust supply coincident with uh, Heinrich Stadium 1 and the Bolling Alarod. Uh, and uh, you may be familiar with records from the Chinese uh, LUS sequences showing um, co-variability between um, China and Greenland in terms of dust, dust change. So there's a number of mechanisms out there for how uh, these abrupt climate change can uh, how these abrupt events actually occurred. So things like uh, f changes in um, ocean circulation brought about by freshwater forcing, um, abrupt changes in sea ice distribution, uh, potentially changes in atmospheric uh, uh, circulation, or more recently, and we heard a bit of this yesterday, just in that you know, the glacial climate may just be intrinsically more unstable. And there's just a couple of examples of this. So sea ice changes in uh, around Greenland can uh, cause uh, quite a, a, a large warming events o over the actual ice core locations. Um, and, and this is an example from Peltier and Vettoretti showing um, intrinsic variations in a, in a copper model with um, uh, abrupt warmings in Greenland of about 10 degrees. So in this work, I wanted to try and um, uh, look at some of those mechanisms, not all of them. Um, the first one is very simple. I've, I've uh, perturbed uh, a general circulation model, in this case had CM3 with some freshwater fluxes, so I've used a very generic one sphere drop over 100 years, uh, put into this region of the North Atlantic. Uh, you know, I, I fully accept that's not very realistic, but it's just uh, a, a means to perturb the ocean circulation and get the kind of climate changes in Greenland that might be consistent with the events. The second um, uh, of the two methods I've tried uh, is really focusing only on changes in sea ice. Um, and to do this, we uh, slightly modified the coupled model, the coupled GCM, to include a heat flux that's applied only under sea ice and only to the sea ice um, in the model uh, over any domain that we cho chose. So we can essentially perturb how much sea ice the model simulates without impacting, without um, artificially impacting other aspects of the model, like the sea surface temperatures or the or the air temperatures. So so we can kind of. Um, in a sense, in essence, retune how much sea ice the model simulates for, uh, in, a, in a given state. And so in the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to be comparing uh, a kind of hosing scenario and a sea ice scenario where they both produce roughly, um, well, actually, I shall move on. Uh, yeah, where they both, both produce uh, approximately equal climate changes over Greenland, but because of the distinct um, uh, mechanisms at play, they, might, they do produce different uh, changes elsewhere. So I take the sea surface temperatures and sea ice distributions from the coupled GCM and apply them in another coupled GCM called HADGEM 2ES. Um, I, I like using models, so I decided to use two of them. Um, this is an Earth system model, uh, kind of uh, illustrated here. And crucially, it includes um, dynamic uh, vegetation, so the, the vegetation the model responds to the climate, uh, and a dynamic aerosol scheme, which is coupled to the vegetation. So uh, the dust cycle in the model um, is dependent on the amount of bare soil that is dynamically assimilated, on the soil moisture, um, and the transport and deposition of dust is, is uh, simulated interactively. So it depends on the uh, amount of rainfall, the wind speed, and so on. So I've evaluated this model for just um, under pre-industrial and last glacial maximum conditions. Just um, uh, this is a, a scatter plot showing the model dust deposition at various sediment core sites uh, uh, compared with observations from the dirt map database version 3. Um, and you can see the model does a, a reasonably good job of capturing sort of the different range of dust deposition rates across the globe from ice core sites to kind of terrestrial and marine, uh, marine sites. And it does capture some of the increase in dust that we see. So there's a, probably a global two to fourfold increase in dust at the last station maximum, the model captures some of that. It doesn't do so well at the polar locations, and you can see there's a, the model is underestimating some of the terrestrial sites in North America and Europe. 
But regardless of that, we'll move on and uh, look at the abrupt, uh, the abrupt simulations with that. So these are the climate fields that um, come out, uh, that result from the two different scenarios. So this is the, um, in, in both cases, it's the cold phase minus the warm phase for various reasons. And on the left, it's showing the, the hosing scenario, and on the right, the, kind of the sea ice scenario. Um, and the top is temperature anomalies, and the bottom shows the rainfall anomalies. Um, you can see that the, the, the temperature change over Greenland is reason fairly consistent, um, but um, the hosing scenario shows a different global pattern. So there's a, a, a bipolar seesaw, you see warming in the southern hemisphere. Um, and as partly a result of that, but mainly because of the absence of any real significant change in the tropical temperatures in the sea ice scenario, you get much larger rainfall anomalies in, as a, in response to the hosing. And, and so this is, you know, very, very consistent with other model simulations. Um, and the, the weaker response in the sea ice is, is consistent with the absence of any real kind of tropical temperature gradient in the anomaly. So what does that do to dust? Um, as you might expect, the, the response to the hosing on the left is, is much stronger, so the dust emissions respond very strongly, especially over uh, the kind of Sahel, Southern Saharan region. Um, dust emissions elsewhere are not so, uh, don't, don't respond perhaps so um, uh, consistently. So for example, in Asia, I don't, we're not seeing the kind of increase in dust that you expect in this cold state. Um, and in the sea ice scenario, there is, there's really a lot less change, and that's kind of as you'd expect from the from the climate fields I showed on the previous page. So the dust deposition, um, it, again, is kind of painting a similar story. There's big increases across much of the globe in the hosing scenario, much smaller changes in the sea ice scenario. Um, notably, we, we don't get, you know, I was going to say a tenfold increase in dust, but we don't even get a fourfold increase in dust that was uh, that Hubert has mentioned in the past talk, we get some, you know, maybe 50% increase in some parts of Greenland. So the, the hosing scenario doesn't by itself, even with the dynamic vegetation response, doesn't give us the kind of dust increase that we've seen in the, in the records. Um, we also don't get some of the uh, dust increase that I was expecting in the kind of northern tropical Atlantic, uh, but there are some uh, interesting features further south. Um, one of the interesting uh, aspects of the response is, a, is a, e even though there's an increase in the amount of dust going into the atmosphere, especially uh, in the tropical Atlantic, there's a, a really strong reduction in the amount of wet deposition. And that's because of that um, southward shift in the ITCZ that I showed a couple of slides before. And what that means is that um, in the region where there's an increase in dust emissions, because it's drier um, and perhaps a small reduction in vegetation coverage, uh, there's also a reduction in the wet deposition. So this allows a lot more dust to be exported from the sort of southern Sahara region across the tropics. Um, and so I calculated the radiative forcing from the dust. So this is a direct dust radiative forcing, short wave plus long wave in the model. And this is just showing you the hosing scenario. And it shows a really strong response, so a really strong cooling, cooling effect on, over the tropical Atlantic um, uh, to the west of the African coast. And that's a response to that both so that's um, caused by both the increase in emissions and the de decrease in uh, wet deposition in that region. Um, so I wanted to put that in context. Um, so these are, uh, this is a global mean radiative forcing between the last glacial maximum and the pre-industrial estimated from several different models, including HADGEM 2ES, which I've used. So it ranges from about minus two watts per meter squared to uh, weekly positive forcing. In HADGEM 2ES, we get about minus 1.2 watts per meter squared globally averaged for the dust change between the glacial and the interglacial. And um, for the hosing run, we get almost exactly the same response. So I think it's a really large, um, in, in the model, it's a very large response. It's comparable to that glacial and glacial change. The caveat being that there's obviously quite an uncertainty range on that global estimate for, for how much dust really affects climate in general. Um, and I will move to the conclusions. So um, I can't stand here and say that my model simulations replicate reality, unfortunately. But they do highlight that um, an abrupt change in the hydrological regime in the tropics has a, a potential to really modify the dust, uh, mineral dust uh, export across that region and potentially lead to large radiative forcing that could, um, uh, depending on how 
how much dust actually really affects uh, climate could affect the uh, could amplify um, abrupt climate changes in that region. Thanks. When you compare the amount of freshwater forcing between your hosing and your sea ice melting, what's the sort of magnitude? Are they similar in magnitude or like in terms of the salinity change? I, I haven't looked at the uh, salinity change in detail, or, or if I have, I can't remember, but um, yeah, it's a good question. It's worth looking into, yeah. But, yeah, one spur drop over 100 years is a really large kick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this nice talk. I understood that you also had vegetation um, interactive vegetation in your model. Mm -hmm. How uh, have you looked at the results and how do they compare to the available pollen record? I'm thinking of uh, Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, in the, yeah, in the base LGM state, we had too much forest cover in Europe, which is kind of a common problem for the LGM um, vegetation state. Um, we, uh, in terms of the abrupt climate change, I, uh, yeah, the, the, the the kind of grass forest boundary shifts south in uh, North Africa, uh, and there's a kind of contraction of grasses in sort of Siberia, but I, I haven't looked, compared that with the um, pollen evidence for the abrupt climate changes, but that would be, yeah, definitely worth looking into. Thanks. I have a question which is related to this. What is your gut feeling what the problem in the model is? Is it the vegetation? Is it the wind distribution at the source, or is it the loss process during the transport? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, yeah, well, uh, one criticism is that at the resolution of this model, so it's about one and a half degrees, that you're not picking up the kind of small scale um, features, wind features that really determine the, the overall dust flux out of a region. So you're not picking up the really high, uh, dust not really strong wind events that actually determine the long term. Uh, transport, but I, yeah, I, I haven't got any results to back that up. But yeah. Hello, so today I'm going to show you some new um, estimates of radiocarbon reservoir ranges in the North Atlantic, and then talk a little bit about how this might feed into our understanding of changes in ocean circulation through the deglaciation. So, um, a quick introduction to radiocarbon in the ocean. So, radiocarbon is produced in the atmosphere, where it quickly equilibrates with the surface ocean. Um, and here it's uptaken by planktic foraminifera. So the carbon-14 in the calcite shell records the time since uh, calcite formation. This surface water parcel is then subducted down to the deep, and here the deep water radiocarbon content reflects the amount of time since the deep water was isolated from the atmosphere. So benthic foraminifera tell us something about um, the amount of time this water amount of time since this water had last seen in the atmosphere. Um, so a caveat for using the planktic foraminifera as a dating tool is that there's some upward evection of this older uh, radiocarbon depleted water so that there's an offset between the surface water and the atmosphere. Um, so looking at radiocarbon in the modern ocean, um, the broad scale pattern is predominantly um, controlled by the overturning circulation. So in the North Atlantic, in the high latitudes, we have uh, young radiocarbon age water that's well equilibrated with the atmosphere, subducting down to the deep, um, where it progressively ages on the pathway through the, uh, on the deep water circulation pathway. And the oldest waters that we see are in the deep North Pacific. And the water t waters here today are around 2,000 years in age. So focusing now on the top 500 metres, which is surface waters where we're interested in, and there's quite different patterns in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. So the Pacific is predominantly controlled by wind-driven um, upwelling in the high latitudes because of the easterlies and westerlies pulling away the water in the surface. Um, and this allows the upwelling of old radiocarbon-depleted water from the deep to the surface, so that re surface water reservoir ages in the Pacific are around 1,000 years. In the Atlantic section, um, in the high latitudes, it's important to note that this process is still occurring, but because we have an overturning cell, the water that's returned to the surface is young in age, uh, 
so that we have a young homogeneous um, water column in the top 500 meters. So while we have a good understanding of some of these processes uh, in the modern, um, because of the intimate link between ocean circulation and your surface water reservoir ages, um, there's questions over the extent to which this has remained constant through time, um, especially in the North Atlantic, where um, you'd expect to see big changes in ocean circulation during the deglaciation. And there's a number of publications over the past 10 years or so suggesting that the 400-year offset that we see in the modern has not remained constant through time. Um, so this project is really aims to reconstruct reservoir ages from multiple sites um, to try and get a better idea how they might have changed through the deglaciation. Um, so here we've generated new high-resolution radiocarbon records from ODP site 983 and 980, and then built new independent age models um, without any radiocarbon so that we can use this as a carbon tracer from both these sites alongside um, DAPC2. So in order to interpret the radiocarbon as a tracer of ocean circulation processes rather than using it as a dating tool, it's important that you have an age model that doesn't contain any of your radiocarbon data. Um, so to avoid this, we've used t um, ties between climatic records in our uh, sediment cores um, which have been tied to both the Hulu Cave record and the Greenland ice core oxygen isotopes. So at DAPC2, um, we chose to tie the record to the Hulu Cave um, oxygen isotopes. And this was firstly because the dating uncertainties are lower in the Hulu, at the Hulu Cave record because of the uranium thorium dating. And also at DAPC2, there was quite a lot of structure in the peak glacial, um, which could be correlated with the more structure that you can see in the Hulu Cave record. Um, at ODP site 980 and 983, um, we tied abrupt warming events to the Greenland ice core oxygen isotope record. And here, um, we tried to minimize the number of ties. And in order to do this, we also measured uranium and thorium between tie points so that we could constrain the sedimentation rates using uh, thorium normalization. And this leads to the variable sedimentation rates that you can see between the tie points on the figure. And also means that we reduced our uncertainty in our age estimates um, in time slices far away from the tie points. So to go on to the data now. Um, so in blue, we have the data from DAPC2. In green is from site 980, and in the purple is from 983. So from the two records from 980 and DAPC2 show a good level of coherence and um, with an increasing offset from the atmosphere as you go from the LGM into HS1. And this agree, uh, agrees well with um, estimates from the rapid core just south of Iceland um, that was measured by Thornelli et al. Um, the data from 983 plot more negatively in delta 14C space than the other two records, perhaps suggesting there's an age model issue at this site, or um, there may be a hi hiatus during the latest um, HS1. So to focus on the other um, two sites for now, we can see that there is a progressive increasing offset between the atmosphere and the, um, and the surface waters as we go into HS1. And then abrupt, there was an abrupt increase in delta 14C. Um, and the marine values collapse onto the atmospheric values um, at the HS1 bowling alloy road transition. And, the f and from this figure, we can see that because there's such an abrupt increase in the marine where there's not so much change in the atmosphere, this suggests that these processes um, are driven by changes in the marine realm rather than a big change in the atmosphere. Um, thinking about this in terms of in reservoir ages, um, we've reconstructed reservoir ages of around 1,000 years during um, the LGM, increasing to around 2,000 years during HS1, 
before decreasing again to 400 years, similar to the modern during the bowling aleroid. Um, the reservoir ranges of 2,000 years in HS1 are significantly larger than we see in the modern. And if this isn't taken into account in age models uh, construction, then it could have a really big effect on the, um, your dated core. So to think now about um, some of the processes that could be driving these reservoir ages and to put the data into some context, here we've plotted the benthic data from the Iberian margin from Skinner et al. And in the orange is the equatorial intermediate water Atlantic corals from Chen et al. So the ben these really give us the two M members of the two sources of water that could be um, influencing the high latitude North Atlantic surface waters. Um, so while the benthic gate data give us an idea of, something of the age of the water coming from below, um, the equatorial corals, while they're not um, surface, it's not surface record, it's an intermediate water record, they can still give us some idea of how the subtropical water that's traveling from equatorial regions um, northwards to the high Atlantic may, that may have changed through time. So here we plot our new records from DAPC2 and Site 980 alongside some um, other published reservoir ages from the region. And we can see that the reservoir ages from the Plantic Foraminifera um, match the coral data well during the LGN, giving reservoir ages of around 1,000 years. And then apart from the most southerly site, um, which tracks the corals through the LGM into HS1, and there's a progressive aging of the reservoir ages um, through this period at the two, at Dapsi 2 and 980, the two uh, sites we've reconstructed. Um, all the sites show reservoir ages of around 2,000 years during HS1 um, before increasing to around 400 years during the bowling aleroid. So to put this into some context and draw together some other evidence for changing circulation across this time period, um, we put together a compilation of Delta 13C records. So this is all, these are all benthic records, but from different water depths. And here we've color coded water depth um, with the darkest blues um, being the deepest sites and the um, lighter pinks being the more shallow sites. So during the LGM, we see that there's a good boundary between the two, um, between the, two, the intermediate and shallow water sites and the deep water sites. Um, and this suggests two distinct water masses. And this coincides with weather, reservoir ages of around 1,000 years. Um, during the HS1, um, these younger, these surface water records collapse down onto the deep records, really suggesting we see this influence of deep water in the surface during HS1. And this is reflected also in the reservoir ages of 2,000 years that we see in the surface. And during the Balung Alarod, um, while there's still a homogeneous water column suggested by the Delta 13C, these values are slightly higher, suggesting that we're now seeing the surface water signal in the deep, and this is also reflected in the lower reservoir ages in the surface. So in terms of thinking about a model of ocean circulation through these time slices, during the LGM, we see a distinct boundary between the two water masses. And we see reservoir ages of about 1,000 years, which is older than the modern. Um, and this perhaps suggests that there's an old source coming from the Arctic Ocean. And this may be plausible because um, of increased sea ice cover in the Arctic Ocean, reducing sea air gas exchange. During the stadium, we see a Pacific-style circulation, or we propose a Pacific-style circulation, where you really feel the influence of um, the deep in the surface waters, both in terms of delta-13C and radiocarbon. And uh, moving into the interstadial, this looks very similar to the modern, where we have a deeply convect convecting um, cell and active deep water formation, so that any water that's brought back up to the surface through abvection is young in age. Okay, so in summary, I've um, shown that there's been some large, surface ch large changes in surface reservoir ages over deglaciation with maximum ages of 2,000 years in, the, um, in HS1. And this has really big implications for the radiocarbon-based age models in this region.
Um, the changes that we see can be explained by a balance of um, upwelling of old radiocarbon depleted deep water and the lateral transport of young, well equilibrated water from the subtropical regions and a potential old radiocarbon source from the Arctic Ocean. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering if you've thought about the, um, the effect of disequilibrium at the ocean surface. So um, the 14C has a longer equilibration time than 12C, um, and this will then have an effect on the reservoir age because it's affecting the, just by definition of delta 14C in the surface. And I don't know if that can also have a very significant effect. In the model, it looks like it does. It looks like it can explain yeah. quite a bit. So that in part can explain what we see. So because there's a lower atmospheric CO2 um, during the glacial, that affects the equilibrium and also the um, equilibrium between the different carbon uh, speciation. But it's not big enough to explain the changes we see. So it's on the order of several hundred years. So that would definitely contribute in part. Yeah. I had a wonder about southern sources wars. Uh, do you? take them into account when uh, explaining your stadial? Do you, have, do you think they can have Southern Source's signature on your uh, old C14 wars, especially during the uh, Einrich event? Um, so it's, it's possible that some of these really old, radio, kind of left it quite open in terms of where these really old radiocarbon ages are coming from the deep, but it's potential that, that the Southern Source water is, is somehow affected upwards from, from the deep North Atlantic. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be talking about deglacial upwelling productivity in CO2 in the North Pacific Ocean. Firstly, I'd like to thank the conveners and acknowledge uh, all my co-authors. How does this work? So I acknowledge my co-authors here. So I'm just going to start by, uh, by explaining the, the kind of very simple idea that, that I'll be talking about today. And that is that the, the northern hemisphere high latitude basins today are characterized by two very different circulation regime, regimes. The, the North Atlantic, you have this strong overturning cell which flushes nutrient poor surface waters through the interior ocean. In the North Pacific, we do not have any kind of, uh, we do not have any kind of deep water formation. We have a very, very limited overturning cell and this allows nutrient-rich waters to mix from the deep ocean into the intermediate depths and into the surface. And that switching between something approximating these two modes of circulation can explain many of the signals we see in the North Pacific over deglaciation. So this is the, the kind of key motivation for this study, and that is that, um, I should say that time is going from right to left on all of my uh, time series graphs. And this is showing opal and calcium carbonate flux in the North Pacific over the last 800,000 years. And what you see is that during every glacial termination, which is shown by these gray bars, you get pronounced peaks in, in productivity within the North Pacific. So these are a, a pervasive feature of, of glacial interglacial cycles, and there's no widely accepted mechanism to explain them. So to uh, investigate what might be going on, we looked at the, the deglacial productivity maximum uh, during the last deglaciation, which occurs during the bolling alarod about 14,500 years ago, um, which you can see in the opal here. And I'm also showing here atmospheric CO2 and uh, orthogenic uranium, which shows uh, intermediate water oxygen concentrations. Now, despite having been discovered uh, about 25 years ago, um, uh, we still don't know what's uh, controlling this, the, this uh, deglacial productivity maximum. Many, many ideas have been put forward, and they basically all fall into two categories. The first is that we, that there was, uh, we upwelled massive amounts of macronutrient-rich deep water into the surface ocean, and this drove the productivity maximum. The second kind of group of, of hypotheses is that the productivity was driven by the alleviation of some other limiting factor, either iron or light. Um, now, what makes this event even more interesting is that at the same time as we see the productivity maximum, we see widespread hypoxia throughout the North Pacific Ocean. 
And the degree to which these two events are linked and actually the direction of causation is, is contested. Uh, it's been suggested that the productivity maximum drove the hypoxia through the respiration of organic carbon. However, it's also been suggested that the hypoxia was driven by a reduction in ventilation or subsurface warming, and the release of iron from, from hypoxic sediments drove the productivity. So to, to, to investigate what's driving these, these profound changes in the biogeochemistry of the, the North Pacific over deglaciation, we generated a, a record of pH using boron isotopes in planktic foraminifera and pachyderma, which is this little guy here, from a core in the Northwest Pacific located in the modern high CO2, high nutrient pool. And this pH record uh, allows us to test these, these two different hypotheses because they both, they, they, they have very different implications for the carbon cycle. If we, if we alleviate iron or light limitation, this would result in carbon drawdown and high pH in the surface ocean. But if we upwell lots of macronutrient waters, this would result in the input of high CO2 water to the surface ocean, and we would see low pH. So this is our new pH record here, and you can see the productivity along here. And, and what you can see, the, the kind of key feature to, to, to make a note of is that during the maximum productivity, we get really low pH waters in the surface of the North Pacific. This tells us the productivity maximum was not driven by the alleviation of iron or light. It was driven by an increase in supply of nutrients and CO2-rich water into the surface ocean. So what's driving these changes? How can you get such a high supply of nutrients into the surface ocean? And what kind of circulation regime can lead to this? Now, before um, considering the deglaciation, it's important to think about what the Pacific looked like during the LGM. So I mentioned today that the, um, the, these two basins are characterized by very different circulation regimes. Strong overturning in the Atlantic, weak overturning and mixing of nutrient-rich waters into the intermediate depths in the Pacific. And you can see this in the carbon isotope profiles of the, these two basins. The North Atlantic is really enriched in 13C, whereas the intermediate waters of the North Pacific are really depleted in 13C, get very, very light values. Now, if we look at the, the, the Delta 13C profile of the North Pacific during the LGM, what you can see is enriched Delta 13C values in the intermediate depths. This tells us that the, the intermediate North Pacific was well ventilated during the LGM, and, it's, uh, and this, is, this is due to the expansion of North Pacific intermediate water to depths around 15,000 meters. And this increase in overturning circulation would flush the nutrients out of the, the upper reaches of the Pacific. Now, now we're going to look at the deglaciation. And what you can see is that during the, the Bolling Hour, the onset of the productivity maximum, we see a switch in the, from this glacial, well-ventilated mode of circulation to the, the modern, poorly ventilated mode of circulation. You see that in the switch from heavy to light carbon isotopes and from young to old radiocarbon. So the LGM North Pacific, we had this kind of uh, shallow, a kind of a shallow version of the, the Atlantic with pronounced overturning. At the Bolling Alarod, we go to something that looks like the modern day where we can mix nutrient-rich deep waters into the intermediate uh, and, and in, into the in, upper, upper reaches of the Pacific. So if the circulation looked basically like it did today, why do we get, uh, why do we get, uh, but the, um, but that, sorry, the, the productivity was much higher than today and the pH was much lower, which means the supply of nutrients must have been higher today, but the circulation was basically the same. So what's driving that? So we, we looked at the uh, PMIP3 uh, model ensemble, and here I'm showing a wind stress curl. And what, what you see, it stands out in every single model is that there's a pronounced increase in wind stress curl within the subpolar gyre in the North Pacific during the LGM. And that's driven by the presence of an ice sheet over North America, which deflects the easterly southwards, so they, so they start shearing on the northern edge of the subpolar gyre. Now, during the LGM, because we had this increase in overturning circulation, we were, we were sucking more, but we were sucking up nutrient-poor waters. 
during the Bolling Alarod, we still had almost all of the Laurentide ice sheet left. So we still had this, this enhanced Ekman suction. But we now switch to a mode of circulation where we have nutrient-rich waters just below the subsurface, which would now be brought into the, the surface ocean. So this combination of factors of, of poorly ventilated intermediate water, like we see in the modern, and enhanced Ekman suction can explain why we see such a high uh, supply of nutrients. So now going uh, to the, uh, so, so we would have had more iron during the Bolling Alarod. This is the dust flux from Cerno et al., which would enable productivity to exceed modern day levels. But importantly, the low pH tells us that most of these nutrients went unutilized, which would have given us really high CO2 values in the surface ocean. And if we convert our pH record to CO2, you can see that we have these really high CO2 values during the Bolling Alarod. And this would have uh, there's a, a very big difference in ocean and atmosphere CO2 would have driven outgassing from the North Pacific. This could have uh, resulted in this, this kind of abrupt increase. We see at the onset of Bolling Alarod. But I think, kind of more importantly, it would maintain the high levels of CO2 we see through the Bolling Alarod. If we look at the Southern Ocean and North Atlantic, the processes we see there, it, it, it points to the fact that CO2 should decrease again. But we don't. We see CO2 stay high through the Bolling Alarod. So I think that this, this release of CO2 during the Bolling Alarod from the North Pacific could be what turns kind of the abrupt events we see into a kind of full deglaciation. Just to think a bit more generally about how this mechanism could operate during uh, glacial terminations, um, I'm now showing the uh, uh, what, what you see is that this expansion of North Pacific intermediate water occurred during every glacial period of the past 800,000 years. All, of, all that's required for the mechanism proposed here to explain these productivity events is we switch from the well-ventilated glacial type of circulation to the poorly ventilated modern type of circulation while we still have a big ice sheet on North America. That, that's the only criteria that we need to fulfill. It's been suggested that the, the uh, increased production of North Pacific intermediate water was driven by um, brine rejection in the Bering Sea, which is controlled by sea ice. Now, if we consider the response time of sea ice and big ice sheets to, to warming, this gives us a very easy mechanism to explain why we would always, uh, you know, if, if we, if we warm, the, warm the climate, we would lose the sea ice very quickly, we would stop this brine rejection mechanism, and we would revert to the modern poorly ventilated state, but we would still have a, an ice sheet hanging around for, for thousands of years more. So this gives us a mechanism that would ensure upwelling, the release of CO2 uh, during every deglaciation, and, and a feedback mechanism between kind of glacial and glacial uh, climate and, and the carbon cycle. So um, just very quickly to summarize, LGM, we have enhanced overturning circulation. We still have more Ekman suction, um, but we're sucking up nutrient-poor water, so we have low nutrient supply to the surface ocean. In the Bolling Alarod, we still have the high Ekman suction, but we switch to, to poor ventilation, and we start upwelling nutrient-poor, carbon-rich waters. These outgassed to the atmosphere and could have driven the the, uh, the, the high atmospheric CO2 throughout the Bolling Alarod. Um, and then the intermediate ocean hypoxia was caused by, we have this productivity event and we also have reduced ventilation, so we would get hypoxia. And then the different response of uh, the reorganizations of ocean and atmospheric circulation responding to sea ice and ice sheets provides a simple feedback mechanism between deglacial warming and atmospheric CO2. So, thank you. Very, very good data. I need some clarifications about your pH reconstructions from mm -hmm. boron isotopes. Of course. Uh, how, how did you convert boron isotopes for, from pachyderma sinistral, right, mm -hmm. to uh, seawater pH? That's my first question. Uh, the second one is, uh, for, for what, what depths is the pH value for? Is it for the surface or subsurface? Or That's a, a very good question. So uh, we converted it from uh, Delta 11 beta pH, in fact, using the, the calibration that's published in, in your paper in, in 2013. And uh, so we need, we need uh, to convert to the delta 11 B of borate, which is a function of pH. And also we need to know 
uh, the, the temperature. So we use the magnesium calcium temperature to get, to get the pH. But it doesn't really make any difference what, what temperatures we use. We, we see a big signal in delta 11b. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? I, I forgot. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the, oh, the, oh, so uh, Pachyderma lives at around 50 meters water depth. So this is n not quite in the mixed layer, but it's just below the surface. Um, if, if, uh, if, if you look today, there's, there's about probably 10 ppm difference between 50 meters and the surface. And actually, during the bottling alarid, we see really warm temperatures, which suggests that they're living very close to the surface. So it's, it's, it's quite representative of a, it's, it's, it's really a surface signal we're seeing at this time. Earlier than, than this, uh, the bottling alarid, you have a very big change in pH as well, which doesn't correspond to any change in productivity or, or yeah. CO2. So how, how do you explain what happened there? Actually, the, the guy sitting next to you, Ben, he, uh, he has a poster about this uh, this afternoon. <laughs> right. So you can ask him, but for the, for the benefit of the audience. Um, yeah, so we, we do see a decrease in pH during Heinrich Stadial 1, and we don't see any increase in productivity. Now, there's a, a whole lot of evidence that, that suggests that during Heinrich Stadial 1, we actually it, we get we get a much deeper overturning circulation in the, in the Pacific and possible deep water formation. And what this would do, it would bring nutrients up, but it also would make the, the mixed layers really deep, which would then induce light limitation. So th this could be a, a mechanism how you could have low pH, but actually not really get any more productivity because it would remain light limited. All right, thank you for having me here. Uh, thanks for the convener for letting me come by and talk to you about some research that my colleagues and I have been working on. Um, and specifically, what we've been looking at are circulation fluctuations over the last deglaciation, and particularly targeting these small alpine glaciers in Ireland. And the reason we do that is because, as we know, the North Atlantic is very sensitive to these abrupt climate changes, uh, specifically those associated with changes in AMOC and the um, associated heat transport that comes with it. And if you look in this figure in the bottom left here, which is a figure from Lou et al. in 2009, that is uh, modeled surface temperature changes between the bowling alarod and the LGM. And I've got you this great big green arrow to show where Ireland is. You can see that the North Atlantic is gonna see a, a wide change of temperature swings during these abrupt climate changes associated with AMOC changes. And because of that, Ireland is particularly sensitive to those changes, uh, also because it's located downwind of the deep water formation. And it's for that reason, then, that, we, that the moraines located in the Irish Cirque glaciers should be very sensitive to those changes and therefore should record any kind of abrupt climate change in Ireland. So this led to our motivating questions in that, do the glacial deposits of Ireland actually record this millennial scale climate variability over the last deglaciation? And then building on top of that, if they do, do we have the ability to decipher a high frequency variability from that moraine record? So to tackle these questions, we went to Ireland and we used cosmogenic surface exposure dating, and we particularly targeted cirques across the entire Ireland, trying to get as wide of a distribution as we possibly could. And we targeted multiple cirque basins that were fronted by two or more moraines, and this provides not only a good chronologic constraint once we date them, but also provides us information on the stratigraphic relationships that will come, become important also. And we sampled moraines from eight cirque basins in total, ranging from 52 degrees in the, the south to 54 in the north. And we used beryllium 10 to date 80 boulders from 14 uh, separate moraines. And the way that we interpret our data is we say that this reflects the onset of glacier retreat from that, that boundary. You could also think of it as um, the onset of deglaciation. So here's a map of one of our sites. And what we're looking at here is, here's the head wall down on the bottom part of the image, and each one of these lines shows the moraine crest at that particular location, with the white dots showing the boulders that we sampled. The difference between the black line and the orange lines are that the orange lines are the ones we were able to date, while unfortunately the black line did not contain any boulders that met our sampling criteria, so it remained undated. But what I really want you to take away from this figure is the, the scale and the relative size of the glacier that would have filled this basin. You can see here that at its maximum extent, this glacier was maybe only about a kilometer in length. And you compare that to the glaciers that we see in the Alps or we see in the Western United States that are on the order of tens of kilometers in length. So this thing is relatively small to the classic alpine glaciers that we're used to.
So now we're looking at an image of that site, but we're standing on the right lateral aspect of the head wall, looking down into the basin. And you can see the Atlantic Ocean off in the distance there. And it may be hard to see, but often on the right here, these kind of bouldery features are the moraines that we sampled. And the reason I want to point this out is because, again, the relative size of these moraines is we're talking about about five meters in, in relief, whereas the ones that we would see in more alpine situations are more on the order of 50 to 100 meters in size. So these are really small glaciers, and I want you to think about that in the context of the amount of time it would take to deposit something of that size. But let's go ahead and start looking at some of the data that we were able to collect. So now we're looking at every one of our boulder ages from Ireland, with on the y-axis showing age going from 28,000 years on the bottom to 8,000 years at the top. And then the x-axis is just each one of the distributions for each moraine. But when we look at the mean age and distribution, or the uncertainty of those distributions, where, which is the mean age represented by the black line and then the shaded box showing the uncertainty, we see that we really get this persistent signal of deglaciation throughout the entire deglaciation, with ages starting at 24,000 years as our oldest and ending at 10,000 years at our youngest. Now, some of these ages are associated with the known abrupt climate change events like the Bowling Alarod and the Younger Dryas. But all in all, we do see this continuous, persistent signal throughout the entire deglaciation. So now here, I'm showing you the same data, but now the x-axis shows age going from older on the left to younger on the right. And in the top panel, we're looking at the same data we were just looking at, with the color scheme still being the same. And the y-axis is just kind of an arbitrary setup so we could see the data easier. But this B panel here, is our, what we're calling our unique deglacial events. And what we did was we looked at the overlap between some of our ages as a whole regional picture to try and correlate ages at different moraines into singular events. But because we had moraine, multiple moraines in singular basins, like we see here in this orange one, we know that this moraine is different from this one. And even though there is overlap in those two ages, they must be different events based on stratigraphic relationships. So taking that into account, our conservative estimates only allows us to create a minimum of seven unique deglacial events across this interval. At the bottom here now, we have the 018 record from the Greenland ice cores, and then the temperature reconstruction from Greenland. And what's important to point out here is that we have this period where we have this relatively stable climate well, maybe not stable climate, but at least stable temperature across this interval where we're getting deglacial events. And that led us to the question of, if we're getting deglaciation at this high frequency across a period of relatively stable climate, what is driving these glaciers to retreat? What is causing the deglaciation? So we did this by testing our Irish glaciers against a numerical glacier model of Rowan Baker. And what we were able to do is we determined that the interannual climate variability present at that time can have a significant effect on the glacier mass balance. And that's translated into the glacier length fluctuations, which would lead to the deposits of moraines. And some of these, uh, these small alpine glaciers that we were targeting, you see just interannual variability having an effect of, of a few hundred meters in the fluctuations of those boundaries. But something to consider on top of that is that the smaller fluctuations are gonna get eroded away by subsequent larger um, fluctuations. So therefore, we only preserve the maximum length record, which is what might lead to our millennial scale, scale signal. And here we're looking at now the output of those model runs, where in the top, we have on the y-axis the, uh, the length of the moraines in kilometers, or I'm sorry, the length of the glacier in kilometers, with the model run going from left to right. And what I want you to see is that we see these few hundred meter um, fluctuations in the length of the, the moraine or of the glacier across these intervals. And this is all throughout a period of relatively stable climate. We leave a mean state climate. So this is just driven by variability. But we wanted to test that a little bit further. So we actually ran it against uh, the temperature and precipitation variability from the trace output of Ireland across the interval of, fifth, of 22 to 15,000 years ago. And we see that we are getting similar distribution or similar fluctuations across, across that interval. And what we would see if this were the actual fluctuations of a glacier is that the longest 
uh, fluctuations are going to be the points where we preserve our moraines, or the ones that are kept, and that would lead to a millennial scale distribution. Now, it's important to point out that we're not trying to correlate any one of these fluctuations to a particular deglacial event that we have dated, but we're trying to say that the model of these interannual variability signals can be preserved in moraines. But something to consider is that the, all of this occurs over a mean state climate. And we know that the mean state of these glaciers changed just based on the fact that they're no longer there. So we had to figure out that what was the climate signal and what was driving these changes, this high frequency variability to where we still lose the glaciers. And the way we did that was we actually calculated the equilibrium line altitude of all of our moraines across Ireland. And that's what we're looking at here with the time going from left to right from 22,000 years to 10,000 years ago. And these are the same moraines that we saw dated earlier with the shading just representing an, a, an assigned uh, uncertainty in our ELA. And then we also show the temperature stack of North Atlantic sea surface temperature records from Ireland, as well as in the light blue here, the, the Greenland temperature stack. And once we look at all of our signal as an aggregate, as all of our, our samples together, we see that there is, we can, are able to parse out the millennial scale variability associated with these abrupt climate change events, where you might see a drop around Heinrich Stadial 1, an increase around the Bowling Alarod, a subsequent drop at the Younger Dryas, and then eventually going into the Holocene. So just to quickly wrap up what we were going over is we now have this beryllium 10, chronolo beryllium 10 chronology of surface exposure dates that showed that we have this persistent deglaciation through Ireland starting at 24.5 thousand years ago and persisting all the way until 10,000 years ago. We ran that against a model that then suggests that we can have these variability or these fluctuations in glacier mass balance simply based on climate variability in a re relatively stable uh, climate. But when we look at all of our glaciers together as a composite signal, it's only when we add all this together we're able to finally parse out what the actual climate signal was in the region across that interval. And what we're trying to say here is that we are showing a record now of high frequency climate variability, or at least glacier frequency, over printing a record of lower frequency variability that is, preserved, that is shown as the climate change. And I'd like to thank Pages for having me out to present this to you, and thank you all for listening. I was just wondering, how well was Ireland covered during the glacial period, and is there a chance of beryllium inheritance in these rocks from previous exposures? So Ireland, it, there's actually some debate over how much Ireland was covered, uh, but some suggest that the, for the most part it was, predominant, it was completely covered. Um, there's definitely a uh, chance for inheritance in these signals, but what we're finding is that uh, what I didn't show you were all the outliers that we didn't include, that we were able to attribute to inheritance and other geologic processes that might have uh, skewed our, our distribution. So uh, thank you for a nice presentation. And I, I guess the obvious uh, alternative interpretation is that you're not dating the onset, no, the, the deglaciation or sort of the retreat from, of the ice, but rather when the moraine is formed. Right. Uh, and I'm thinking, and you don't really have any independent way of testing that except for, the, for many of these cirques, you have lakes inside the moraines. So right. looking at the youngest uh, moraine and then also the, uh, the uh, age of the uh, onset of organic production in those lakes could give you an indication whether you're actually dating the uh, retreat from the moraine or mm. the formation of the moraine, I think. Right, yeah, that'd be very important information for us to have. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know of too many of these lake records, at least from these particular cirque basins that we could compare against. But it's some data I would absolutely want to get my hands on if we could. Thank you. Really interesting talk. Um, it was more just a suggestion, and you were comparing it to the Greenland records for your kind of climate right. scenario. But I would just suggest that Ireland's potentially, uh, Greenland's potentially not the best place to be looking. And maybe if you look at some Northeast Atlantic records, there's a lot of climate variability within the Younger Dryas and within the Heinrich event that may correlate with some of these events. Right, yeah, thank you. Actually, a figures that I did not show you is that we did that, and we found that a lot of the proximal records to Ireland show that a similar uh, shape to what we show, see in the Greenland record, where you have uh, 
out of the younger, out of the LGM, it's relatively stable until you get to the bowling alley rod. I'll just come and um, check on the resolution of some of those. In the they're very, system. they're very low, right? We're yeah. talking about. So records. there are some high resolution that show a yeah. lot of uh, variability in Heinrich water. Yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, I'll, it, I'll chat later. Yeah, let's see. I've got, got some data to show. There have been some previous evidence that also show constant reorganization of the rest of the Eurasian ice sheets um, mm -hmm. over the last glacier maximum. So basically throughout this time span where you see changes in, the, uh, in your record in the island. So do you, will you look into some potential linkage between um, the, your glacier over here with the rest of the EIS and see whether there's potentially like a coherent mechanism or um, um, that drives the change? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what was the mechanism. <laughs> So I'm just wondering if you think there's a link between the changes in the in your um, island glacier with the rest of the Eurasian ice sheets that have been constantly oh. reorganizing throughout the period that you're right. seeing change. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There are some great papers specifically targeting the Irish ice sheet where you see these millennial scale variability also. And um, it's actually a project I'm trying to work on with Paul Dunlop, who's at the University of Ulster where we get at China. He has these great marine records of, um, he has multi-beam data of, mar of moraines off the coast that are now getting dated. And we want to use those to kind of constrain a little bit more of the, the fluctuations and to compare those against maybe the Scandinavian ice sheet and look at if there's any kind of coherence between those two signals. Thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you for your coming. Uh, my name is Rong Wang. Right now, I work in the second institute of oceanography, SOA, in China. Today, I will give a short uh, introduction about part of my PhD job in RV Germany. And uh, this is my prestigious title. We focus on the Tegener's record in Bering Sea to refer the paleoclimate and environment uh, variability. So, the scale of climate change have different time scale from million years to decades. We focus on the millennium to centennium time scale. Generally, since around 30 calendar KABP to present, there are several different uh, climate events, including the cold ALGM, H1, and the younger driver, and the warm BA and the Holocene. So how to become a famous and global climate event? For example, when the H1 happened in the North Atlantic, they needed the medium to amplify and transfer the influence to other places. The wet lies, the Mohalai, and the glaciers should be the medium, and so. So our study area in the Bering Sea, which are weaknessly influenced by the, the Mohalai and the wet lies, but strongly by ice sheet. So, what happened in Bering Sea during these climate events? Synchronization or unsynchronization, it's a problem and very interesting. And in detail, we find an unnormal melting water event in North Alaska, the Brooks Range from the literature. We checked the Canadian Geology Survey report of Dyke 2004 based on the extent and the chronology result. We found that the glacier in Brooks Range disappeared during 60.2 to 15.6 calendar KBP. So it's during the cold, middle to late H1 event. And to be a small ice sheet, the Brooks Range are normally ignored by the climate model. To reveal the reasons of melting during the cold event, Firstly, we want to find the sediment evidence in neighboring oceans. The terrigenous materials are the major parts in marine and the lake sediment. For studying the terrigenous sediment, we should ask three questions, from where to where and how to transport. They can help us to rebuild the paleoclimate process. The two key proxies are very old. They are green size and clean minerals. With the help of the colleagues, all the lab work was done by myself in RV Germany. For green size, we removed the organics, carbonates, and opal, and used the Marwin 200 machine to test. And uh, then we used the uh, antimember 
analysis to analysis the result. For clay mineral, we separated the clay with wet sieving and uh, Stoker's, Stoker's law setting and tested in MTU XRD machine. We used the Biscaya factoring, uh, weighting factors to calculate. That means chlorides, smectites, elite, and kilonite constitute 100 percentage. Other minerals in clay contents have extra percentages. So let's move to a statement called SO202, 18, 3, and 6. It's in the north bearing slope around the 1,100 uh, meters depth. The sediments from the Inopex project. We got the H depth models directly from the colleagues Hartmut Kuhn in RV Bremerhaven. The H models are based on a combination of correlation to the NGIP record, core to core correlation, and layer counting. Based on the calibrated age, the H depth model was established with liner interpolation covering the last 32,000 years. So for the green size, EM1 with fan, fan seat should be, uh, represents the fluid suspension, have high view in H1 and the BA event. EM2 with fine sand represents residue sediments and a strong winnowing effection, just have high view since the Holocene. And AM3 with coarse seat should be hemipelagic sediment. For clay mineral, the uncommon part is the peak view of kelonite and the elite crystallinity during a late H1 event. So there must be a provenance change during the late H1 event. Uh, clay minerals are very good proxies for tracing to the south. So let's have a look at the kelonite. Most of the parts are stable around the 8 percentage, but the peak views are more than 10 percentage. So where is provenance of kelonite? I would like to give you the whole evidence chain using backstabbing approach. Firstly, from the paper of Nido in 1983, we can find that high view of kelonite lies on the North Alaska Shelf and the several river mounts in Bering Sea. And I marked the river in modern time which have more than 10 percentage of kelonite in red color. It's also from Nido's uh, paper. So we can find that the four rivers are around the Brooks Range. So Brooks Range looks like a potential south. Then we check the geology map of Alaska. The Brooks Range have large area of Paleozoic sedimentary rocks, which can be added to kelonite. So right now we have evidence chain from Brooks Ranger geologic situation, river transportation, and high modern surface kelonite in the ocean. We can see that Brooks Ranger are at least an important kelonite provenance for the Bering Sea. So uh, what costs uncommon kelonite peak view? What's the dynamics? Let's back to the graph. That should be, should be the melting water, the date, fits our peak view of kelonites very well. Then we compared our date with ice top oxygen in Greenland, ice cores, the conclusion of global sea level changes in the glacial period. The two red uh, arrows are the global melt pulses in, uh, during the warm BA and the PB period. So High fluvial runoff are based on the fine green size EM1 and the clay contents and the XIF of calcium to titanium. And the melt water based on the preliminary results, kelonite and the uh, uh, elite crystallinity. We still have normal proxies, including uh, the carbon, laser, and, uh, and the opal. Uh, OPA have high views in warm B and PB, showing high productivity spikers. The anoxic lamination, which distributes widely and synchronizationally in North Pacific, also occurred in our course with the 
broom, uh, with the broomstick. So it's another evidence for dating and to, to, to give evidence for our melting water data. Finally, we reconstruct the paleo environment in our study area. Uh, during uh, late H1, melt water brought the kelonite from Brooks Range to the Bering Sea. The exposed shelf made the river months close to our study site. In the BA warm period, fluvial discharges brought high productivities, causing the anoxic lamination. And during cold, younger dryers returning to normal situation with decreased fluvial runoff and productivities. With the sea level rise and the reopening of the Bering Street, <laughs> modern circulation pattern appeared, causing the strong winnowing effections. So, let's conclusion our case studies. So we find an unusual melt water from Brooks Range during late H1, and the melt water input in our study area did not contribute to the anoxic lamination. That's, not, that's different from the before hypothesis. And the nutrient and high productivities should be brought by rivers. So for the future work, I joined the China Arctic Research Project we went to the Arctic once every two years before, and with the new icebreak ship in 2019, the frequency will be yearly. So right now I got some new calls in the Bering Sea and the Barefoot Seas. I, I'm, I'm, right now I'm uh, doing the lab work about the two calls. I will try to find more evidence for the melting water events and uh, the IRD and uh, all the iceberg um, materials in the future. So thank you and gracias. You have an interesting productivity peak as well in HS1 um, that you don't see elsewhere in the subpolar Pacific. And I was wondering if there was any, um, with your age model, considering changes potentially in surface reservoir ages in the high latitudes, whether or not that could be um, synchronous with the bullying LRAD. Uh, sorry, could you re repeat? I didn't yes. understand. Um, so in your plot, you showed an increase in productivity during um, Heinrich Stadial, so prior to that sort of canonical bullying Alarad productivity peak that you see throughout the subpolar North Pacific. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if um, you could bring, those bring your age model into consistency with other um, productivity records by um, looking at changes in potentially surface radiocarbon reservoir age. Yeah, yes, thank you. Because we have the division of the job uh, for the projects. I, I, fo I focus on I'm in charge of the territorial uh, proxies. So we use the productivity proxies from our colleagues. So that, that, that's the reason why I can't do more. <laughs> Is there any evidence of the meltwater in Alaska on the land surface that there was a large meltwater pulse or any that it even that the Brooks rains even drained to that sector of the bearing? You mean the surface water uh, evidence from? Yes. Uh, right now we do, do not have, because we get it from the sediment course, uh, and we remove the organics and the carbonates, the, some biological, we just keep the terrigenous uh, evidence. So we just can know the source and the transportations. And because there are very big uh, river named the Yukon River there. The Yukon River? So it can brought the melt water to the Bering Sea. So, but yes, in the north, there are four to five very short rivers to the Arctic Ocean. I want to find more evidence in Arctic. I'm talking about the simulation of the last glacial interglacial transition with the carbon atmosphere ocean ice sheet model. And I did that together with my colleagues Florian, Maria, and Werner from our institute. Uh, probably going somewhere here. Uh, turn that one. The model that we're using is actually not an EMIC, it's a fully coupled GCM. It's the coarse resolution version of our CMIP free model that we had at Max Planck. Includes a dynamic vegetation model and is fully interactively coupled to the PISM ice sheet model, to a variant of the PISM ice sheet model for the northern hemisphere, at least including all the pieces that are interesting for the ice sheets in a 20 kilometer resolution. 
We used here a very simple ma surface mass balance scheme. It's a positive, de positive degree day scheme. And on the southern hemisphere, ICE-5G was prescribed with all its strengths and weaknesses. It's a two-way coupling, and we don't invoke here anomaly coupling. So they really are going through this uh, fluxes. The land sea mask, and I should say that as a cautionary remark in this situation, is fixed at the LGM state, simply because we're not in the state yet to uh, run with uh, interactively changing land sea mask. Uh, and the topography, but the topography for the ocean and also the runoff directions uh, for the hydrologic discharge model are calculated from the actual ice sheet model topography. And that includes, of course, the uh, land as well, where the ice has retreated. Uh, and with this model system, we made a couple of simulations uh, where the transient forcing that we prescribed were the greenhouse gas concentrations, the insulation, and, of course, ice 5G in the southern hemisphere or basically Antarctica. And to save time, most of these simulations were run in a periodically synchronous mode. That means uh, ocean and atmosphere, not no, ocean and ice sheet, see the right time scale of the forcing, but the atmosphere is accelerated to save computer time because most of the computer time was used for the atmosphere, but it doesn't have the long memory that we were interested in. And to make sure what this implication does, there's also one relative short simulation with a fully synchronous simulation where all the components of the model system see the same forcing and nothing is accelerated. And if you look on the time series, for example, for the global SST, you see that they're relatively synchronous, all of them. Uh, uh, they all show, the whole set of simulations shows basically a warming starting at 7K, 17K, which is simply due to the prescribed greenhouse gas forcing. But I should have said that the periodic, most of the simulations started slightly before the LGM and were run into the early Holocene. It doesn't make much sense to run through the whole Holocene because the L LGM land sea mask is prescribed. And uh, one simulation was started in 42K. Looking at the freshwater flux global, which of course is in, a, in, the, in these time scales, the time derivative of the mass of the simulated ice sheets, uh, you see that we, that's something between 35k and approximately 20 or 21k, the ice sheets are growing, and that's only the northern hemisphere. And afterwards, after 20k, the ice sheets in the northern hemispheres are shrinking. And of course, during the warmer climate, then of course, the rate of the shrinkage during the deglaciation is rising. But you see, this is not a very smooth curve, there's a lot of dynamic in it. You see some distinct events and some peaks in it. Looking a bit closer on the freshwater flux into the lapper, which goes into the lapper sea, which is not just the ice sheet flux, but also, of course, the atmosphere ocean, the atmosphere flux, and later on also the river runoff, you see that we have very marked distinct events with a typical amplitude of 40 to 50,000 cubic meters per second discharge events, and the typical time scale between them is something like 5,000 years. So this is very similar from these features that we see here, like Heinrich events, and later on, of course, the freshwater flux into the Labrador Sea increases simply during the deglaciation, which is not a surprise. And all these time series show a big jump at the end. And for the overturning circulation in the, in the Atlantic, the strength of the overturning circulation, we see that during the glacial, the typical value that we have in our model is about 18 swirl drops, but we see there's a lot of fluctuations, and some of them are quite large. And during the deglaciation, uh, the strength of the overturning is reduced, and in some simulations, you see a collapse during the, let's say, the end of the deglaciation and the transition to the Holocene. And now comes an interesting exercise. I have to show a movie, and uh, I'm not really sure how to do that, but we'll see. Yeah, okay, so that should start. What you he show he see here is a movie of this long simulation that we had, and it shows the shape, shows the ice, shape, ice sheets, the simulated ice sheets, the color shows the strength of the, uh, the speed. And if it's red, you really have a surging event. Now we see a big, nice Heinrich event in the simulation. Uh, now we're approximately at the time of the glacial maximum, strong Heinrich events again. And you see now the ice sheet, especially the Laurentide ice sheet, has a strong shrinkage. And the shrinkage is not just very smooth. You also see strong episodic, you see strong surging events, also on the southwest flank of the system. And now you see the colors in the ocean and call the convection. Now you see the convection sets in into the, uh, in the Nordic seas again. Go. So back to now. Uh, 
find the uh, 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 that PowerPoint. Ooh, 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 ooh. It's one of these ones, yes. Okay, so yeah. Good. Oop. Go next one. Good. No, that should good. Now, when you see in the model hat simulate some Heinrich events as internal part of the model variability, and now we want to an analyze here uh, well, how a typical Hein simulated Heinrich event looks like. And for that technique, we took composites and we excluded the very first ones because they might be hampered by the spin-up time of the, the long of the early ones, and we also included the deglacial ones because they are, of course, also different than the purely glacial Heinrich events. So if you want to compare with Heinrich 1, this is not the right way because this is a deglacial Heinrich event. Uh, and you see they are all aligned according to the uh, ice discharge from the, uh, through the Hudson Strait. And you see, on the top you see the freshwater flux, the thick black line gives you the mean event and the colored are the individual lines. And you see the typical event that we have is a bit more than 40,000 cubic meter per second. The duration is typically a bit more than 1,000 years. But you see also see the time evolution of the individual events is uh, very variable. It's not always the same event. And we also see a strong effect uh, on the overturning in the Atlantic. And the typical value that we get from that one is about three spur drops simulated. And in the following, I will show some 2D plots. And this is are also composites. And I will show the time slice, which is invented by the blue one during the peak freshwater input compared to the time before to illustrate the effect of the Heinrich event in, in the atmospheric variables. Uh, this in the top, you see the two meter air temperature anomaly. And it's, of course, not really surprising that during a Heinrich event, you get cold temperatures over the North Atlantic. This has been shown before in many simulations. You see that the cooling, not particularly strong, spreads, especially over the Arctic, but also over many parts of Eurasia. But what's also quite remarkable that we see is strong warming over the Laurentide ice sheet. And this is simply due to the lowering of the surface because the ice has been discharged and so the ice surface, of course, is lower. What we also see for the precipitation here is the green means more precipitation. Uh, we see on the areas where we had the surges before in the Laurentide ice sheet, we see more precipitation. So the atmospheric feedback helps to regrow the ice sheet after a discharge event. Uh, over the most of the North Atlantic, we see drier conditions, uh, and this, these drier conditions also extend all over Europe. So the Fennoscandian ice sheet sees less snowfall during this time, during this Heinrich event, and it's uh, kind of, of course, this is not good for the growth of the ice sheet. And together with colder temperatures, so essentially, it certainly will lose a bit mass. Uh, we also see what's typically for the changes in the thermohaline overturning. When we weaken that, we, in, of course, increase the thermal gradient over the tropical Atlantic, and this causes the inner tropical convergence zone over the Atlantic to shift south, shift southward, together with drier conditions in the Sahel zone. And this somewhat extends all over India and up to, maybe even up to China. So and the, the other topic is now to look into the deglaciation in the in the sim, you know only focus here on the synchronous simulation which was run from 22k to 8k. The top you see the global mean SST. T. Again you see the rise starting from around 17k. Below you see the strength of the AMOC. You see the strong, the weak reduction of the AMOC if you run into the deglaciation. Of course, this partially is a warming effect. Partially this is the freshwater effect that you have there. But you also see there are a lot of fluctuations on this. Some of them, if you look on the bottom, you can clearly identify as Heinrich events. But you also see, especially uh, the 14K is also a meltwater event, but that goes through in the model through the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico into the Atlantic. It's sufficient to keep, skip it down. And from approximately 13.3 to 9.6K in the model, the overturning Atlantic collapsed completely. And what is quite interesting in the end of when the system basically comes back around 9.6, the fresh water input into the laboratory Two minutes. sea jumps up. And I will now try to explain why this happens. And this, the point is really that the model has an interactive river routing scheme, which of course it has the potential to change river routing. During the glacial and also during the first, most of the deglaciation initial phase, the Laurentide ice sheet loses its mass, and lots of the mass loss is on the southwestern side of the Laurentide ice sheet. And the, all the meltwater 
is discharged into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, at the 13.3 K event, you see then suddenly the freshwater input into the Arctic jumps up by more than 0.1 square drop. This is really a redirection in the model into the Arctic Ocean. And the mechanism that is responsible for that one is that the Laurentide ice sheet is kind of retreating towards the east, especially in the northern part. The land was suppressed before that, and as a consequence, you have close to the ice edge uh, a trench. And this is the channel that leads to the event, uh, discharge to the north. So if you look for the discharge patterns, uh, you see before all this stuff is discharged into the Gulf of Mexico, and later on, the stuff goes to the north. And this freshwater input, the redirection of the meltwater input to the Arctic really is then shutting down the North Atlantic overturning circulation. Coming now to the other end, when the system basically jumps in, in again, and this is, you see before the event still, the freshwater is discharged to the north into the Arctic in the model. At 9.6 K, simply the Hudson Strait opens, and now most of the melt water has the chance to escape into the Labrador Sea. And this is what you see by this, the two time series, the fresh water input into the Arctic and into the Labrador Sea. And the fresh water input into the Arctic, you see some fluctuations, and these are caused by changes in the uh, discharge in the Penoscanian ice sheet, which uh, the Siberian rivers and sometimes also enter through the uh, Nordic seas. But they don't have a strong effect on the overturning. And if you just, this redirection from the Arctic into the Labrador Sea, and uh, the consequence from that one is that the model starts with uh, strong convection in the Nordic Seas. And of course, freshwater input into the Arctic has a stronger effect on the salinity in the Greenland Sea than freshwater input into the Labrador Sea. And that is the mechanism that brings the overturning in the model in again. Coming now to the conclusions. The model is able in itself to create Heinrich-type events as in part of the internally model-generated climate variability. Uh, what we do see in the deglacial de simulations that the redirection of the runoff, and of, especially of the meltwater from the Laurentide ice sheet, uh, first from the, to the Gulf of Mexico, then to the Arctic, later on into the Labrador Sea, are major players in explaining the uh, modeled variability of the Atlantic marital overturning circulation. And a similar explanation, for example, this redirection into the Arctic has also been suggested by Tarasov and Paul Dieck as the uh, cause for the origin of the Younger Dryas. And of course, the location of the input from fresh meltwater into the Atlantic at different locations the sensitiv uh, has a very different effect. So the sensitivity of the Atlantic on these different locations uh, is very strong. And I would claim, based on the results that we saw here, that the change in river flow directions due to the changing ice sheets and the resulting topography is a first order process and must not be neglected. And it's highly nonlinear, so you can have very strong local ice effects, and it's very difficult to get them on the right timing. <laughs> so I don't claim that we have done it yet. <laughs> and a bit of advertisement that you're planning to go to next year's ETU meeting. There's, on the weekend before, there's an international conference on our Palmer conference and also especially modeling the glacial cycle. Thank you very much. Anyway, so I'm Alan Condren. Um, we're working on these uh, uh, subtropical iceberg scours of, which are found off the coast of Florida. We've been working on those uh, a number of years now. Um, and also, this is probably my last talk for UMass Amherst. I'm actually taking a position at Woods Hole. Um, but anyway, we'll get on to the talk. So we've been spending a lot of time over the last few years thinking about the role of coastal meltwater, sorry, coastal boundary currents in the ocean and how they sort of redistribute runoff that comes from the land. And essentially, um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, what we're finding is if you, if you discharge uh, runoff from, say, a Hudson Bay into one of these coastal currents, it can get transported quite a long way away from where it came from before it gets mixed into the ocean. And what ties nicely with this is what I'll talk about more, I've talked about this quite a bit in the past, and this is kind of a follow-up in a way to some of this work, is with these iceberg scouring uh, events we found off the coast of Florida, and they quite nicely support this idea that terrestrial meltwater can get, in, or 
you know, confined to these narrow boundary currents and get transported miles away from where it came from. So a boundary current essentially, you know, a good example of such a thing would be like a Labrador current or the East and West Greenland currents. It's very fast flowing compared to what's going on in the interior of the giant. Quite separated as well from what's going on in the interior. Often there's a strong sort of frontal boundary, which means there's a sort of temperature or salinity gradient, which separates what's going on at the coast from what's going on in the middle. And as a result of that, often if you put mount water into these boundary currents, it doesn't like to go into the interior of the gyre. It takes some, perhaps some sort of topographic roughness or some, you know, which might induce some eddying to go get it out of the current and into the interior of the ocean. So uh, quite a few years ago now, when we started this work, uh, we showed that if you're going to model coastal boundary currents in models, you need a really higher resolution. And you're getting up to what we call an eddy resolving, eddy permitting models, essentially models that have enough grid boxes to capture what's going on on the coast. And a lot of kind of like paleo models that were existing when we wrote this paper weren't at high enough resolution to capture these narrow coastal features. The sort of follow-up to that project was um, my, co my colleague Jenna Hill got in touch with me after seeing our results from our 2011 paper um, and say, hey, we have these, uh, I have these iceberg scours off of Florida. I'm not quite sure where they came from. And essentially what they are is, or we believe what they are, is what they're caused by icebergs drifting down the east coast of North America. And they'll ground on the seafloor or they'll plow through the marine sediment, pretty much like a farmer plowing his field. And as these icebergs touch into the sediment, they'll kind of cut these grooves into the, into the seafloor. And you find them where you can trace them basically south of Cape Hatteras all the way down to Florida Keys. There's a lot of them. Um, it gets less of them as you go south, which is perhaps indicative of them melting as they're coming into more subtropical regions. But what's kind of really interesting is that if, obviously if you go to this region today, this is the region where the Gulf Stream is flowing northwards. So it's actually incredibly hard to get an iceberg to these regions. And this, you know, obviously you get some nice imagery of, of these features. Um, there's, there's places where they'll sort of get stuck for a bit and then they'll melt and then they'll lift off and then they'll carry on uh, moving. And what we found out, what we wrote about in our 2014 paper was that if we put enough, if we released enough fresh water out of Hudson Bay, um, we can get a coastal meltwater current that flows essentially from Hudson Bay all the way to Florida. And it's fast if you put enough fresh water in. It takes about 90 days from Hudson Bay to, uh, to Florida, okay, so it's really going for it. It's going about one meter a second. And um, how far south it goes is very dependent on how much uh, the flux of the meltwater you release. Not necessarily total volume, but just how fast it's released coming out of Hudson Bay, okay? You can do exactly the same experiment for the St. Lawrence, where you can release meltwater, and again, it also gets to Florida. In fact, the results from the um, St. Lawrence and the Hudson Bay experiments are pretty much identical. So that's what we wrote about. So what's in this talk? Uh, well, we thought, well, okay, let's actually add some icebergs into this. And this is a paper we're going to be uh, publishing, or it's actually submitted now. If we put, actually physically simulate icebergs, um, can we get them to still get them to Florida, and can we get them to plow through the marine sediment? Okay, so can we create sort of what I call synthetic uh, iceberg scours? So a lot of my time has been spent over the last few years developing what's called MIT Berg, it's an iceberg model, essentially, that uh, allows icebergs to, to drift and melt, and it's uh, coupled to MIT GCM. Uh, this has pretty much occupied a long period of my life. Uh, it was originally funded by the US Department of Energy, and the, the motivation for that was to look at meltwater coming off of Greenland and Antarctica, and sort of more future scenarios, in a way, and how that might impact AMOC. Um, so this sort of spin-off is using this iceberg model um, in the sort of paleo context, okay? Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but obviously to get an iceberg to move, it's a summation of the drag forces. Um, you know, it's obviously Newton's second law. It's essentially, you know, uh, force equals mass times acceleration. Um, you sum up your forces, and the iceberg will start to move. If your iceberg is really big and heavy, it takes a long time to get it to move, like pushing a big boulder across the stage, perhaps. Um, but you'll, get, uh, you'll sum up, so the force of the water, the wind, uh, sea ice on the iceberg, uh, Coriolis force, uh, R, whatever that might be. Um, uh, I'm going to guess that is... Anyone? Anyone know what FR is? Uh, oh, waves. Um, and pressure gradient force. And then for melting, well, 
uh, pretty much icebergs don't like to get warm, and they'll melt when they get warm, so we'll go with that. It's coupled to the model. When the icebergs melt, they add fresh water at a temperature of zero degrees C and at a zero PSU salinity, so they freshen the ocean. What's kind of cool about MIT Berg is if you look at panel one, so most iceberg models that are out there, well, pretty much 99% of existing iceberg models only consider the drag force from the surface layer of an ocean model being exerted on the iceberg. A more realistic way to do this is to have some sort of multi-level um, advection scheme, which is the box two, uh, where you consider the drag force at each level in the model that the iceberg penetrates through. And what we do in MIT Berg is we kind of make the icebergs look a bit more like icebergs, they kind of look like ice creams. And this describe, what we call this keel parameterization makes them look, I guess, yeah, like icebergs. And as you got, this was, it comes very important later on when the icebergs get quite far south and they start penetrating through this meltwater that we're gonna, you're gonna see in a minute. And at the bottom of the iceberg is in the Gulf Stream but the top is in the meltwater. And so you get this balance between the drag forces. So if the, if the Gulf Stream's pushing it too much to the north, then it will go north instead of south. That's a bit of a problem. So the model we're using, it's MIT GCM. It's uh, a sixth of a degree, so it's what they call uh, eddy permitting. It's almost eddy resolving. That's sort of the next thing on our list to do. It's a global domain, despite the uh, image here. Um, it's got, essentially, it's based on uh, CSM4 LGM simulation, and then spun up for a bit at this sixth of a degree resolution. And what you see is, if you think about how that compares to modern day, is that the Gulf Stream is very zonal, and the subpolar gyre is quite expansive. And so we stick some icebergs into this. Our spin up of our icebergs is actually very short. Um, the, the number of icebergs seems to stabilize very quickly. But the amount of icebergs we're releasing is 6,300 gigatons. And this is taken from uh, Will Roberts' paper, where I just basically took the mean of what was in his table one of his paper. Um, there's three carbon locations in this simulation I'll show you. They're from Hudson Bay. And we have 10 uh, sizes. And the maximum size in these simulations, I think, an iceberg can be up to about a kilometer in size. It's maybe a lot small. But anyway, there's 57,000 icebergs on any day in the North Atlantic, somewhere between five and six times what you might find in a modern day simulation. And it looks like this, okay? So this is density of icebergs, um, plotted at sort of a mean density, if you like. And you can see, obviously, it fits quite nicely where you think icebergs might go. They kind of go over the IRD belt, in a way. And the south extent of the icebergs is very much controlled by where the Gulf Stream is in this simulation. They don't like to go, they don't like to get warm, basically. But if you do this control run, you'll see that our scour marks, which is highlighted in this red box here, um, are still south of where the icebergs can freely drift to. They're not getting to our Florida sites um, on their own, and they're gonna need some help. And that's what we were talked, that's what we basically published in our 2014 paper. Uh, we've kind of repeated some of those experiments. I'll talk about uh, how you get icebergs and you release a lot of fresh water basically to get there. And the key simulation here is this uh, movie I'm going to show you. If you release uh, five sphere drops of fresh water, let's see if this works out of the north. It's not going to work now, is it? Hey, hold on a minute. Go. Come on. You can do it. That's killed two minutes. So the icebergs are freely drifting in the North Atlantic, and then you release a, a meltwater outburst. And you'll, what you'll see is they'll get dragged down, basically, to where Florida is. You can see them coming down the coast here. And after a while, uh, they'll get there. They take a little while to get there. Um, there you go, they made it, OK? So the few of them have made it down this coastal boundary current in this meltwater flood. And I'll play this one, which is slightly uh, quicker. It's a sort of zoomed-in version. But you can see them going over, riding, it's almost like surfing the uh, meltwater from Hudson Bay down the coast. And they'll get through Florida Strait, and they'll come around, eventually they'll come around the tip of uh, Florida Keys. It's about 100 days uh, from the time the meltwater is released, okay? And then what we've done since then, we followed up by saying, well, how many of these things would actually, like, create a scour on the seafloor? And we sort of, like, uh, try to simulate scouring in the model. And somewhere between 5 to 20% of icebergs coming down the coast will make a scour on the seafloor. But what we find is our icebergs are not big enough to what the observations suggest. The ones that in South Carolina are only creating scours in water depths up to 45 meters, which is uh, if you back out 120 meters for an LGM. Sea level being lower, you get a, you'd find that scour in a modern day water of 165 meters. But the observations are about 200 meters. So right, we don't think our icebergs are quite big enough. Okay. 
Same thing for Florida Keys. And we also done, very quickly done some other sensitivity experiments where we just leave the tap on instead of that having a massive meltwater flow. This is leave the meltwater discharge on. The result is that even if you keep pumping 0.1 spur drops out of Hudson Bay, you can't get icebergs to Florida. And the same thing if you try and artificially shift the Gulf Stream to the south, perhaps the, the rationale being a, 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 something to do with the, the change in the height of the Laurentide influencing where the Gulf Stream is. Again, you can't still get icebergs to Florida. The only way we think you can do it is one of these, uh, some sort of glacial outburst flood. We believe the actual magnitude of the flood is perhaps still slightly in question, uh, but we believe that these scours are a direct evidence that perhaps during deglaciation there were uh, large glacial outburst floods, perhaps caused by a breach of an ice dam. And as I said, this seems to be the only way that we can actually get there. And the final point on there, I think, is that uh, maybe we should be looking in other locations for iceberg scales, perhaps in the, sub, um, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, would this perhaps give us an indication of past stability of the Antarctic ice sheet? And I'll stop there. Thank you. If I understood, only if you put a lot of sweat drops, you're able to get the icebergs to Florida. But what if, if the AMOC was weakened already? Have you tried something like that? Like, couldn't the icebergs travel more if the, if, if the circulation was reduced? Yeah, it's more to do with the, uh, I mean, it's more to do with the strength going through Florida Strait. It's the Gulf Stream. Yeah, how that's tied to, whether that's directly tied to the strength of AMOC is, I'd say, debatable. But yeah, I think ultimately what you want to do is reduce the strength of the Gulf Stream. Yeah. Uh, the five sphere drops is interesting, though, because it's not the, uh, necessarily the duration of the flood. The flood actually itself, it's the magnitude of the flood. So five spur drops is great for getting it there, but it doesn't have to be a, a year flood. Basically, the, the, the duration of the flood you need is um, the time it takes from the meltwater to get from Hudson Bay to Florida, which is about four months. So it, it's, more, it's more the flux than the duration. Is there any way to um, date these uh, scour marks so <laughs> that you could, um, you know, if it's one or two events or, or if it happened regularly or, you know, how often did this happen? Yeah, um, <laughs> yes is the answer to that. Um, we, my, my colleague Jenna Hill, has a, we have a cruise uh, for next, well it's next year now, Jenna got pregnant, um, <laughs> which pushed, pushed the cruise back a year. We were supposed to be going out this, this spring, but it's going to be next year and we're going to we'll call them and date them. Uh, maybe I missed it in the beginning, but I just wonder, is there any records of drop stones close to the shore of Florida? Uh, I, I don't know, actually. I'm not kind of the wrong person to ask about that. I mean, I know, I know people like Lloyd Kegwin have found, yeah, IRD, uh, mm. traces of IRD, what he described as IRD coming from mm. bird poop. Uh, small, <laughs> small amounts of it. I don't know. Yeah, there is potentially some IRD down there, but not a lot. I know there's IRD at Bermuda Rice. And we see a lot of icebergs going to Bermuda Rice. Um, that answers your I question. Mean, yeah. uh -huh. This would be very helpful for your model, also, maybe. And for the dating. 